just entered the theater of an alien sky. If the words and images seem strange to you, there's a reason for this. Our world was once a vastly different place. To experience this won't hurt you, and there is nothing to fear. Myths and symbols of a prehistoric mother goddess have long enchanted investigators of the early cultures. One reason for the fascination is the connection of the goddess to the earliest forms of artistic expression. In their creation of revered goddess figurines, what were these prehistoric artists depicting and why? Examples are abundant, but where are the plausible explanations? From the vantage point developed in this video series, might we discern something concretely experienced, but unknown today? Amongst all of the prehistoric goddess images, the most attention has gone to the so-called Venus of Willendorf, categorized as Venus de Autopagia, the obese Venus. Along with thousands of counterparts, this unusual theme poses a profound question as to Earth's prehistoric environment. Beginning in the 1960s with the first stirrings of a so-called goddess movement, researchers began to selectively interpret the prehistoric theme, seeing it in the context of envisioned matriarchal cultures. But then, almost as quickly, that interpretation receded into the background. In the mid-1970s, we proposed that a close congregation of planets, Earth included, moved through a cloud of dust and gas, obscuring the background stars while highlighting the unique appearance of the gathered bodies as a living form. We suggested that this occurred long before any such body was named as a planet and prior to the quasi-stable polar configuration we've discussed at length in this series. What was seen in that prehistoric epoch was not static, but produced a complex of spiraling aspects, toruses, and other features, often including a tapering extension of gas and dust descending toward the horizon of observers on Earth. This earlier, more primitive goddess form presents a radical contrast to everything we've learned about the later evolution of the polar configuration. In this phase, we see little or nothing to suggest direct solar illumination of the planetary participants. In fact, no indication of any cosmic cycle whatsoever, and certainly nothing comparable to the revolving crescent in the polar configuration, few if any radial discharge phenomena either. In seeking to comprehend the prehistoric goddess, we begin with one inescapable assumption that widespread patterns must have an explanation in human experience, even if that explanation has yet to be recognized. Of course, it would be futile to search for reference in the sky today. The sky has changed. But the ancient motives can be revealed by simply following the evidence for an unusual condition. For example, what does the unnaturally rotund goddess aspect signify? Why are arms and feet so frequently missing? Or why the often conical or tapering lower limbs? Or the occasionally tapering upper aspect? Or why the unnaturally spherical, often featureless heads or other spherical aspects of the goddess? As to the uncertainty of theoretical interpretations, we offer a tip of the hat to Wikipedia. The original cultural meaning and purpose of these artifacts is not known, Wikipedia states. That is indeed the truth of the matter. Anthropologists and archaeologists cannot explain the motive or the cultural context for the prehistoric goddess images. But one recurrent pattern in particular gives us a window into the prehistoric condition. Certain unique features of the archaic goddess remind us of the toroidal forms we previously observed in the evolution of the polar configuration. 
In the prehistoric setting, this aspect shows up almost endlessly, often appearing as a pair of unnaturally spherical eyes, somewhat similar to the eye mask we've highlighted in earlier discussions. But we also see these unnatural eyes accompanied by other toroidal forms, seemingly with no natural place or function. In the prehistoric period, this toroidal aspect stands out most prominently in its connection to folded arms enclosing the breasts of the goddess, sometimes from above and sometimes from below. This variable form deserves a closer look. By all appearances, the observer standing on Earth experienced something close to an edge-on view into a toroidal configuration. But it seems that librations in that position highlighted an alternating appearance of the goddess's arms above or below the toroidal boundary. In both cases, it's the repeated connections of the goddess's arms to the toroidal enclosure that give us the enigmatic but most familiar pose of the goddess. Ambiguities in our first impressions will generally disappear under closer investigation. In the most common view of the goddess figurine, an observer may not immediately realize that the goddess's arms fold over her breasts, and yet that position becomes undeniable when seen from a side view of the goddess. More frequently, we see the arms of the goddess in the lower position. The conclusion standing out above all other details is the implied toroidal form of the goddess's arms, marking out and highlighting the enclosed space. Once discerned, that general pattern becomes predictable across a large number of prehistoric goddess forms, and in many cases it will be impossible to miss. Our proposed answer to the mystery of the prehistoric goddess requires nothing more than a medium of gas and dust and charged particles through which planets formerly moved. Planets immersed in this dusty plasma cloud, engaged in continuous electrical transactions, the one requirement to produce all the formations anciently observed, including the entire variety we've already documented in this series. But can the connection between the Paleolithic goddess and planets be named more precisely? Clearly the modern scholars who first named the ancient goddess images as Venus figurines had no idea as to how appropriate that language might become as these artifacts began to draw more scholarly attention. And of course the Paleolithic goddess images arose long before the polar configuration we've described and that means long before the astronomical identification of the goddess with a particular planet, Venus. And yet this undisputed fact still leaves the question as to why, with the rise of planetary astronomy in ancient times, the newly trained observers of the sky consistently identified the mother goddess with just one planet, Venus, and no other. So we cannot afford to overlook the question of cause and effect. Throughout this series of discourses, we've suggested that none of the mythic archetypes, not a single one, could have arisen under the present sky. The sky changed. But now, just as clearly, we can see that the earliest prehistoric forms of a mother goddess also point back to an unfamiliar sky in Paleolithic times. This evidence deserves to be followed with the same attention to detail that we've applied to the later polar configuration. Is it possible to reconstruct an ancient experience before the emergence of the polar configuration? What changes in Earth's celestial environment must have occurred after the dominance of this archaic goddess form to inspire the great civilizations or the consequent explosion of writing, storytelling, the emergence of kings and kingship rites, all with little or no precedent in the earlier epoch. On their own, the prehistoric goddess images do not sufficiently clarify the cultural context, and many details seem to appear out of nowhere. And yet the recurring similarities are suggestive of something much more profound than mere absurdity or outlandish caricature of female forms. These curiosities are an open invitation to systematic comparative investigation, as we shall further document in our next episode.